Good morning. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. It's so good to be with you in the great city of El Paso. Uh, I want to thank you for the opportunity to address the committee this morning on behalf of the members. I'm sorry. Could you please state yeah, your, your name and Chris your Wallace, affiliation? Uh, absolutely. Chris Wallace, President, COO, Texas Association of Business, our State Chamber of Commerce. Um, it is good to be with you this morning um, on behalf of the members of the Texas Association of Business. What I'd like to do this morning is uh, uh, give you some specific data as it relates to business from our members, give you some specific uh, examples uh, from various parts of the state, particularly from small to mid-sized businesses that are impacted uh, if NAFTA were to go away. As a neighbor to Mexico and the 10th largest economy in the world by GDP, Texas, as you know, has significant stake in the health of free trade and particularly the success of NAFTA. TEB has been a vocal supporter of NAFTA from the very beginning, from its original uh, negotiation to its implementation, and we remain a steadfast supporter of NAFTA today. Uh, our members uh, require that uh, all across this great state. We, uh, last year, uh, February of last year, created the Texas and Mexico Trade Coalition because our members are telling us how important NAFTA is to their business and to the Texas economy. This coalition represents business and associations all across the state uh, dedicated to fortifying the strong economic relationship between the United States and Mexico. Our coalition uh, continues to meet with top government officials uh, as all of you do in Washington, D.C., uh, and from both countries, the United States and with Mexico and with Canada, uh, from Vice President Pence to Wilbur Ross, our uh, great Commerce Secretary, to uh, USTR Lighthizer. Uh, we've had some great meetings from coalition members uh, with um, members of the administration to express concerns that if Texas, uh, that if we were to withdraw from NAFTA, uh, how Texas certainly would be impacted. I will report to you that uh, as many of you have conversations with our 36 House members who represent Texas and Senator Cornyn and Senator Cruz, really all have been uh, wonderful to work with on NAFTA. Uh, they all understand the importance of NAFTA to Texas and are working very hard uh, on behalf of the businesses of Texas. And I want to thank, while I'm here, I want to thank Borderplex. I want to thank John and Woody Hunt, and Laura Rodriguez, and Tommy Gonzalez, and others from El Paso who have joined our Texas-Mexico Trade Coalition. Uh, I wanted you to know, members of the committee, that uh, as your state chamber of commerce, we're working hard with this coalition to make sure that the business voice is heard in Washington, D.C. as the number one exporting state. Let me give you just a little bit of business data and some of the numbers uh, and some, some specific uh, examples from our members. There is uh, little doubt uh, that Texas will be a major loser should the U.S. elect to pull out of NAFTA. We enjoy uh, 11 billion trade surplus with Mexico, which is almost entirely dependent on the success of free trade. Since 2006, Texas exports um, <coughs> of goods of NAFTA signatories have grown 71 percent, as you heard earlier, while exports and services have risen to 45 percent. An undermining of the tariff policies that have allowed that growth would be a huge uh, detrimental effect to many sectors of the Texas economy. NAFTA, as you know, has significant impact across the many economic sectors of our great state, from energy to beef production. Most of those effects come from our close proximity and partnership with our great friends in Mexico, which serve as the number one export and import market of our state. As a state, Texas's trade partnership with Mexico has become integral to the economic engine over the past two decades, with about $173 billion worth of goods exchanged between our two economies every year. That figure is a, is a result of a whopping 540% uh, growth in Mexico trade since NAFTA was signed in 1994. According to our partners at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, approximately one million Texans, one million Texans rely on trade with Mexico and Canada, 387,000 jobs with uh, Mexico and the remaining with Canada. So we uh, obviously have to have that great tie to our southern neighbor. 
It is estimated that NAFTA has created 190,000 Texan jobs on its own and has led to double-digit growth in 24 of the 32 industries that export to Mexico. And those gains have been balanced in populations across the state as well as all 11 metro areas in Texas. Have even seen increased exports to Canada and Mexico since NAFTA was signed, including many areas with export increases of 100 to 200 percent or more. The bottom line is Texas and U.S. consumers benefit significantly by better pricing, often improved quality of goods created by import competition. NAFTA not only benefits Texas and U.S. and Texas manufacturers, but it also fuels small businesses, as we heard earlier. The backbone of our economy in Texas, and more than 125,000 small to mid-sized businesses sell their goods in Canada and Mexico today. Let me give you just a couple examples. Right here in El Paso, uh, Global Containers and Custom Packaging, a company focused on packaging solution, employs 15 people right here in El Paso. Uh, Jose and Luis, the founders, are part of our coalition. We're very happy about that. They specialize in creative, realistic, diversified, and reliable products to meet a company's operational needs, targeting the automotive, targeting the electronics, food, and medical industries. Their location, significantly placed on the border, allows them to give personal, reliable service to all of their customers and easy access to global markets. So we're very happy about uh, their success due to NAFTA. Another example is Air Tractor. You may have heard of Air Tractor in Olney, Texas. They have uh, been around since 1972, small business. Uh, they ha have one location there in Olney. Uh, they operate uh, 3,800 aircraft throughout the world. Their team of 250 employees manufactures agricultural-based airplanes, or the yellow crop dusters that you see and forestry, firefighting airplanes as well. And they are very dependent, obviously, on foreign trade, particularly with Canada and with Mexico. Another good example is Longview-based uh, Bioderm. Bioderm is a small business. Uh, they produce BioGroom, a whole line of uh, outstanding quality of uh, pet products. And they are now, matter of fact, the Longview Chamber just named them Manufacturer of the Year. Uh, this local company exports their products to Mexico and to Canada, many other places around the world. They have 20 full-time employees. So that's three great examples from various geographical regions of the state of small businesses who are certainly impacted if, if we were to lose NAFTA. So let me give you just a couple other points on how Texas um, will lose uh, if we pull out of NAFTA. Perhaps the most significant economic sector, which we haven't really talked much about today, is the natural gas industry. And as you may be aware, Texas pipelines carry more than 4 billion cubic feet of natural gas a day to Mexico. The American partnership with the Mexican energy sector um, certainly provides a critical to fueling that nation's electricity demands. For the U.S., Mexico provides a critical market to help mitigate the effects of a glut in American natural gas production. Allowing for that sector to continue is tremendous growth despite stalling American demand. Undermining NAFTA could certainly jeopardize that development and force the Mexican government to look to other countries like Peru and South American countries to satisfy its energy demands. Trade also um, provides an economic boon for Texas. Approximately 14,000 tractor trailer rigs cross a single border entry every day. That's the gateway to the Americas International Bridge in Laredo, Texas. Every day, each paying a toll that contributes to local tax coffers and carrying everything from dishwashers to car batteries. Uh, the mayor of uh, Laredo actually refers to NAFTA or his town is NAFTA on wheels. Local officials have estimated that one in every three jobs positively, uh, are positively impacted by trade with Mexico. So it's very, very important to uh, not only in El Paso, but other border cities all along this great state. So we must build a stronger NAFTA. There's no doubt that when NAFTA was created, we didn't have the internet. 
So uh, there has certainly been a lot of technology advances in the way business uh, conducts itself today with technology. So yes, there has to be some advances in NAFTA, and as Cornyn likes to say, Senator Cornyn, let's improve upon it, but let's certainly don't do away with it. A stronger NAFTA would reflect the value of American intellectual property and promote uh, greater information sharing among NAFTA partners. Primarily, this involves protecting innovators uh, our innovators here in our great state with clear and enforceable rules on cross-border data flows and intellectual property rights, all which need to be addressed in a new NAFTA. So in conclusion, given our uh, prominent role in Texas as a trade hub, uh, obviously, as John mentioned, speeding customs and transportation processes will lead to increased trade volume and maximize the benefits of NAFTA's provisions. <clears throat> Also, in conclusion, NAFTA um, has proven to be uh, our economic engine for the state of Texas as the number one exporting state. It creates high-skilled jobs. It provides renewed economic mobility for Texans, uh, Texas workers with billions of dollars in goods and services flowing across our state border uh, every day with, uh, with Mexico. NAFTA has positively reshaped the Texas economy over the past two decades and made it a key port in both regional and global trade dynamics. We really appreciate your strong commitment to this issue. We appreciate your leadership uh, to every one of you, members of this uh, very valuable committee uh, to our state, and uh, we appreciate uh, you uh, continuing to work with us to make sure that our 36 members of Congress and two senators in the administration know the importance of NAFTA to our great state. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, because we certainly appreciate what you're doing with businesses, and in particular, small businesses in, in the state of Texas. Any questions, members? Chairman White? Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Wallace, real quick, um, I know you probably don't have this before you, but if you could just forward it to me. Uh, small businesses, medium-sized businesses in Polk, Tyler, Jasper, Newton, Hardin counties. I would like to know how they are benefiting from uh, NAFTA. And uh, I know for the obvious reason, most of our discussion is on the bilateral relationship with Mexico. And look, I get it. Uh, you know, people are assembling things south of the border and then, then they're coming over here and we're doing other things and then we're selling them here in, in the country. Uh, what, uh, since your members are talking about this with you, what are they talking about? Because there's another, there's another player in here, and I, I know why it's not being discussed, because of where we're located right now, today. But what are your members telling you about Canada uh, in the context of their subsidies, uh, of their timber industry, and how it's hallowed out the timber industry in my district? Absolutely. It's just as important. Uh, and yes, sir, I'll be happy to give you the information specifically on the small business and the impacts. But, but we're hearing it uh, just as loud on the Canada side. Uh, six I'm not talking about the Canada side. I'm talking about my side. They, they are their subsidies. I understand we don't want to undermine the tariff situation between Texas and Mexico. I get that. Okay. But in Polk, Tyler, Jasper, Newton, and Hardin County, all timber. Okay, um, I'm hearing about Canadian subsidies that are hollowing out the industry in my five counties. So how are your members, because you're the you're Texas business uh, association, I'm Texas representative, so I'm not really concerned about Canada because apparently their howling means that the deal is pretty good for them. And I'm a, Mr. Chairman, I'm gonna go ahead and put, show my hand uh, I see the benefits of this Mexico-Texas relationship, but for the most part, I think this NAFTA thing, and as it relates to my district with the tariff situation in Canada, I don't really know if that's free trade. I think it's managed rigged trade, okay? So what are your members, because I, I think I know some of your members that are in my district, what are they saying about Canada, not from the Canadian side, no, but from our side? They're saying, Representative, from, from the Texas side, is that it's very viable in terms of their trade with Canada as well. In, in the timber industry? No, no. Okay, I would like to invite you to my district and walk you around and see the hallowed nature of those industries. In terms of the competition. In terms of the competition. There, 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 there is no doubt that members of the timber industry uh, feel uh, an unfree, uh, un, Rigged. Uh, 
un, uh, a competitive disadvantage, let me say that. Because, because of, of the, the agreement. Because of the agreement. That's I right. mean, see, free trade to me would mean if I want pine timber uh, um, board, I can get on the Internet, or if, I, if I'm the distribution guy for Home Depot, I, you know, I could buy it from Canada. I could buy it from East Texas or whoever. I, don't, I wouldn't necessarily need um, uh, someone to do a tariff or sign an agreement. So um, as uh, the chairman is doing a very good job in getting us around the state and, and chatting this up, um, I'm seeing the, the, the great benefits realistically uh, when I'm here in El Paso. I would like to hear how this agreement is um, positively impacting, okay? And I would like to hear more discussion about these Canadian tariffs uh, on our timber and how they're, they're, they're rigging it under NAFTA, okay? And, and my people are losing. You bet. No, and we're, we are more than happy to dig into that more for you um, in terms of our members who are related uh, directly, indirectly to that industry and how they do business in Canada. Over 600,000 Texans are directly impacted by trade with Canada. And so you are exactly right. We need to look at tariffs on the, you know, certainly on the Canadian side as well, not just on what we're doing with Mexico. Yeah. Obviously, as our number one trading partner, Mexico, our southern neighbor, is highly important to us. But we uh, certainly have to look at Canada uh, as well. Matter of fact, we've even discussed, uh, uh, as interest builds, that there may be an interest for a t Texas Canadian, uh, Texas Canada trade coalition as well, uh, as many of our businesses in Texas do business with. with uh, as know, long as it's not rigged against East Texas. Absolutely, understood. All right. Another question, yeah. uh, Mr. Chair? Well, just more of a comment, uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Um, with respect to lumber, uh, it's important to understand that uh, there was a pre-existing softwood lumber agreement between the U.S. and Canada, that it was outside of NAFTA, and there has been an ongoing dispute even, even prior to NAFTA related to uh, the, the fairness or lack thereof of trade in the lumber industry among and between Canada. And so a, a lot of that has occurred outside of NAFTA, although it, it, is, it is somewhat related. I know that we have someone from the Bush Institute here who may be able to speak to that issue. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, one, one Senator? Question, I might, uh, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, I think Chairman White brings up a good point with respect to NAFTA's impact in other communities across the state. I think we've got a good picture of statewide why the state benefits from the trade. Um, and the exports and so forth. But his point about his district, I think, is important uh, with respect to the rest of the legislature, the members. Uh, what does NAFTA mean for their districts, both positive and negative? I mean, I think that would go a long way towards having good point. people yeah. uh, have a better appreciation as to what NAFTA means to, to the state. Absolutely. And perhaps even gain support as well for, for the uh, continuation of the treaty. You bet. Is that, is that something that uh, maybe the Texas Association of Business can put together in terms of district by district kind of impacts? We'd be happy to, Senator, absolutely. Uh, we already have some of that data, you know, whether it's agriculture out in, uh, uh, d you know, just north of us, uh, to manufacturing opportunities here, to timber yeah. in the chairman's district. Uh, we've... Uh, We've got data from all of our businesses all across the state in terms of how they're impacted uh, by, by this treaty. Uh, certainly happy to provide sure. that. Thank you for that. You thank bet. you for your testimony. You yes, sir. Any other questions? If not, thank you so much for your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. We, we'd like to now call Matthew Rooney. Good morning, uh, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, Madam Chair. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here with you today. My name is uh, Matthew Rooney. I'm the director of the Economic Growth Program at the George W. Bush Institute in Dallas. I, I had a kind of a voluminous slide presentation that I promised to spare you most of, um, but would like to refer to the last couple of slides in speaking. Um, <clears throat> it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, in El Paso, a place that I visited off and on over the years, uh, in particular uh, during the period when I was uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary of State in charge of 
relations with uh, Canada and Mexico, uh, and in that respect, um, came to El Paso a number of times. My writ included the uh, International Boundary and Waters Commission, the U.S. Consulate in Juarez, and the Border Environmental Cooperation and Consultation Commission. So it's a pleasure to be back. Uh, very briefly, um, on the Bush Institute, we are a think and do tank founded by President and Mrs. Bush upon leaving the White House in 2009. Uh, we are, the do tank part is important to President Bush. Every time I talk to him, he says, but what are we doing? Uh, and we, our, our objective is not just to put out ideas, but to try to see them uh, adopted into policy. Um, my, my piece of economic growth is embedded in our domestic excellence initiative alongside our education reform, military service, uh, and other pieces of our domestic, um, our domestic work. We also have a, a number of pro programs we carry out around the world. Uh, and we have a very vigorous program of engagement with our community uh, in Dallas and in, and in North Texas. So our economic growth uh, program came into existence essentially around two themes, NAFTA and immigration, both themes that President Bush uh, felt very strongly about in office. As governor of Texas, of course, he was uh, directly involved in the implement implementation of NAFTA in the 90s. Uh, he was, uh, I think, um, I'm not sure he was the first president to make Mexico his first foreign visit as president, uh, but he was one of a very few who have done that. Generally, American presidents go first to Canada or the United Kingdom. Uh, president Bush made a very uh, concert, um, uh, concentrated and, and conscious effort to build a strong relationship with Mexico by making it his first port of call as president, and he remains committed to a strong relationship between the two countries. Um, our North America global competitiveness agenda uh, came together starting in 2015, so before uh, the, the, the controversies that have arisen in the intervening period. And, and what we did there was we brought together a working group of experts from government and business and civil society and academia from all three countries, Mexico, Canada, and the United States, for a series of focused discussions about um, how NAFTA had affected the competitiveness of all three countries, how and how NAFTA could potentially be improved, or at least how the relationship among the three countries could be improved to enhance that competitiveness still further. Uh, one of the cornerstones uh, of that initiative is our uh, economic growth uh, and competitiveness web tool. You can find it at uh, www.bushcenter.org slash North America. You'll find there the little image on the right is a, snap, is a screen grab from it. You'll find there a series of statistical measures of the competitiveness of the North American group and the individual countries in the North American group benchmarked against the competitiveness of other major trading groups around the world. We also look at the impacts of the integration process that's happened in North America on growth, job creation, uh, and global trade. And we find there a largely positive story. Uh, North America is the most competitive among the major trading groups around the world. The United States, of course, uh, is among the most competitive uh, nations in the world. Um, uh, but nonetheless, the average of the North American group still puts us in the kind of Germany, UK range of competitiveness around the world. Moreover, uh, as the three economies have traded and invested uh, more among themselves, in fact, uh, all three economies have grown faster than comparable economies that are in other economic, develop economic integration mechanisms like the EU. Uh, we have all three added jobs. Um, some 35 million jobs, roughly 30% job increase in the United States alone. All three countries have added jobs since NAFTA was signed at a rate that exceeds the rate of job growth in other industrialized countries that are in economic integration mechanisms like Japan, like Korea, like uh, Germany, like France, like the UK. And our global trade has expanded dramatically. Uh, exports plus imports in this case, setting aside for a moment the question of the trade deficit. Um, our global trade has expanded uh, dramatically. And in fact, what the, one, of the, one of the stories that emerges from that website is of um, a trade relationship between the United States and the rest of the world that is expanding um, much faster than our trade relationships with Mexico and Canada. In other words, what we're seeing is that Mexico and Canada are increasingly becoming the tail that drives the competitiveness and global trading machine of the United States. So um, 
we can debate the benefits of a trade surplus as opposed to a trade deficit. My own view is that uh, the proper way to look at the impact of trade is imports plus exports, not exports minus imports. Uh, and when you look at it that way, um, the impact of NAFTA has been that our global trade has expanded dramatically. I'm going to skip the piece about immigration because um, we're here to talk about NAFTA. Um, you all asked me to focus uh, on, the, on the negotiation process. Uh, I think others have alluded to it here today. I won't pretend to have been sitting in the room uh, when many of these discussions took place, but um, I, I think I have a pretty good sense of where we're going. Let me just start by noting the stated negotiating objectives uh, that the administration laid out roughly a year ago uh, when it announced its intention to renegotiate. And I stress these a little bit, uh, for, for, you'll see why in a moment. Uh, the administration said it wanted to reduce the bilateral trade deficit, uh, that it wanted to maintain existing market access and expand opportunities where possible, that it wanted to enhance transparency of regulation, that it wanted to ensure rules of origin that incentivize manufacturing in the United States, uh, and that it enhance and, and open uh, opportunities in, in other sectors. And I stray all that because um, <clears throat> the the administration is operating under a grant of a delegation, in effect, of negotiating authority uh, from the Congress, which under the Constitution has responsibility for foreign trade, uh, to the executive. And that grant is commonly referred to as TPA, Trade Promotion Authority. In the past, it's been called Fast Track. Uh, and what that, that is a piece of legislation. And what it does is it defines the objectives <clears throat> that the administration must um, achieve if it wants to bring a, an agreement to the Hill to the Congress uh, for a straight up or down vote. And, and so many of those negotiating objectives are consistent with TPA. Uh, some of them are not. TPA does not make um, a specific level of the trade balance into a negotiating objective. It does not make um, incentivizing manufacturing in the United States a trade negotiating objective. We can debate whether that should be the case, but that is, that is the fact. So uh, as we've seen the negotiations unfold, um, a number of things have happened already. It's been alluded to already. Um, one of the things that, that it was widely taken for granted we would do in this negotiation is take what is commonly referred to as the TPP issues. That's the Trans-Pacific Partnership uh, that the Obama administration negotiated. It was uh, essentially a dead letter on the Hill. The Trump administration pulled us out of it in its first days in office. Um, but, in that, but Canada and Mexico were members of the T are members of the TPP group, and we had reached, reached agreement with Canada and Mexico on a number of those modernizing issues that everybody talks about, e-commerce, uh, regulatory transparency, disciplines on currency manipulation, disciplines on state-owned enterprises. Uh, and so it was, it was obvious that we would attempt to put those into NAFTA in this new renegotiating process, and that has largely, that has largely happened. Others have talked about um, energy. Uh, the big thing that, that happened when NAFTA was negotiated, of course, is that Mexico uh, at that time still had a state-controlled energy sector and was not willing to negotiate uh, market opening for energy in the context of NAFTA. And so there is a U.S.-Canada energy provision that is a holdover from the U.S.-Canada free trade agreement that preceded NAFTA, predated NAFTA. Uh, but NAFTA has, in effect, a carve-out for Mexico. So uh, Mexico, having reformed its energy sector, this renegotiation of NAFTA is an obvious opportunity to lock those reforms in, uh, in a way that's beneficial to Mexico because they're, uh, they've made those reforms. Uh, and also beneficial to the cause of a, uh, creating a North American energy superpower, which is, uh, which is certainly within our reach. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about regulation. You're probably aware that um, uh, as a result, actually, of the Bush administration's uh, effort to um, do a, a kind of brush up of NAFTA 12 years ago, um, there have been bilateral uh, regulatory cooperation processes, U.S.-Canada on the one side and U.S.-Mexico on the other side, designed to avoid um, divergences in regulation of new products and, and, where possible, to overcome divergences in regulation of existing products. Um, President Reagan used to complain about uh, how there were different regulations for jelly beans uh, between the United States and Canada. Uh, that is, unfortunately, still the case. Um, turns out to be harder than you would think uh, to, to overcome that. Um, and uh, so there's been an effort in the current negotiation to create a trilateral regulatory cooperation process that would 
fully engage the regulatory. We're talking mostly here about product safety, consumer safety type regulation, uh, and ensure that as new products uh, develop, we don't have divergences. One of the issues that was on that agenda when I was working on it, when I was still in government, was the kind of plug we were going to use for electric vehicles. Uh, why don't you just uh, upfront agree to a single kind of plug so we don't have to build that cost into it? If you left, leave the reg regulators on their own, they're liable to come up with different plug designs as anybody who travels internationally knows. Um, so those kinds of things um, have, been, have been, I think, successfully built into the agreement and represent uh, a kind of a, a, a benchmark that, that the agreement can use going, going forward. The key issues that I think remain are, it's been alluded to already this morning, rules of origin for autos. The administration has asked for a rule of origin that would require 85% NAFTA content and 50% U.S. content in order for a finished vehicle to benefit from duty-free uh, access to the United States market. That has been highly controversial. Uh, it's not even widely supported by the auto industry in the United States. Uh, it's been resisted ferociously by the Mexicans and the Canadians. There are some signs that uh, there's, there's an effort to find a way around that. In, recent, in, the, in the past week or so, uh, the administration has started to talk about linking uh, duty-free access to the United States for vehicles to the wages paid in the Mexican factories that manufactured the Mexican parts of the car. Kind of a creative idea, gets at the issue of differential wage levels uh, that, are, that are perhaps driving some of the investment um, across the border. Difficult to enforce. Uh, you're asking a customs officer at the U.S. border to make a judgment, in effect, as to uh, whether the wages that were paid to the Mexican workers that made the widget in the car that he's inspecting or she's inspecting uh, were paid an appropriate wage. Uh, so that is, that is um, remains a difficult issue. Uh, the administration has wanted a sunset clause, that is, uh, that NAFTA should expire after five years unless the three governments proactively take action to renew it. Um, that's controversial for a number of reasons. Obviously, it introduces a level of uncertainty. Anybody who's investing on a time horizon longer than five years is going to find that a, a troublesome provision. And I think uh, we haven't heard too much talk about that recently. Uh, certainly, it's been resisted ferociously by our Mexican and Canadian friends. Uh, finally, dispute settlement, uh, very controversial issue in the United States, not so much because it has had a concrete effect on our ability to conduct policy. The United States um, generally does not get taken to dispute settlement. Uh, the times that we have been taken to dispute settlement under NAFTA, we have won every time. Uh, Mexico and Canada have, gen have not generally, but have lost cases when they've been taken to dispute settlement, yet Mexico and Canada support maintaining dispute settlement uh, in the agreement. So it remains to be seen exactly how uh, we, we get over that uh, hump. Um, so the path ahead, as I mentioned, we've seen some recent comments that suggest that the administration um, is working very hard to reach some form of agreement uh, next week. Uh, the president will be in Lima, Peru for the Summit of the Americas um, and wants to have something to announce. Uh, so that, that, is a, that is a promising sign. I think as I already mentioned this morning, the Mexican and Canadian trade negotiators are in Washington as of last night um, and, and apparently attempting to meet, reach some kind of, kind of overarching high-level agreement in principle uh, that they can announce at the summit uh, in order to put the issue to rest uh, past the election cycles that are coming up. The Mexican presidential election is obviously um, a huge milestone that's coming right up on July 1st. Uh, it's, it's, um, it introduces, as you all probably know, uh, one of the longest transition periods in the world, I think. The Mexican president becomes, it takes, is elected on July 1st, but doesn't take office until December 1st or 2nd. Uh, and so there's, that creates a very long period where it's difficult to conduct a meaningful negotiation uh, with the lame duck administration. And then we have our own midterm elections in November. Uh, the outcome of those elections will not necessarily uh, prevent the administration from bringing an agreement forward, but will certainly change the political landscape on which the administration will do so. Finally, I alluded earlier to TPA. Uh, TPA uh, expires uh, on June 1st of this year. Uh, the president has asked for it to be rolled over under the terms of the TPA grant. Uh, that request will be granted unless the Congress takes action to, re to deny it. So the expectation is that TPA will be renewed. Um, 
probably unchanged. Unchanged. I think when TPA was negotiated five years ago, it was a protracted uh, political negotiation within the Congress and between the Congress and the administration at the time. Uh, and, and I don't know that there's an appetite or time, for that matter, for the Congress to go through a process of fundamentally revising TPA. If TPA is revised, uh, is re renewed without any significant revisions, then the, frame, then the challenge remains for the administration to present a, an, an agreement that meets its stated objectives and meets the criteria of TPA. And you've seen uh, Senator Hatch made a number of statements in the last two weeks um, uh, kind of laying down a series of markers that the administration had to cross that hurdle if it wanted to um, secure an up or down vote on its renegotiated TPA, uh, its renegotiated NAFTA. Uh, so I, I leave with you the, the details of my presentation uh, for the record, and I'm grateful again for the opportunity to be here with you this morning and be happy to take any questions that you might care to ask. Any questions? Question. Chairman? Yep. Uh, just really quickly. I you heard a little bit uh, earlier, you, were, you, were, you observed the, the frustration of my colleague, the chairman from East Texas, uh, related to, to job losses in the lumber sector. And one of the challenges of trade is that uh, the negative impacts are felt acutely and the positive impacts are dispersed oftentimes throughout the, the workforce and throughout the economy. So it is, w when they are felt acutely, and you have uh, targeted job losses, as, as there were here in El Paso in the textile industry shortly after the um, entry into force of NAFTA, um, you, it, it is impossible to ignore those things. Can you discuss uh, two things? One, how NAFTA sought to uh, soften the blow of these job losses that, are felt, that were felt in places like El Paso right after the agreement. Um, Actually, I'm, I'm going to add a third thing. Two, uh, discuss softwood lumber and the dispute that uh, the U.S. has had with Canada that uh, and the softwood lumber agreement, I think, predates NAFTA by at least uh, 10 years. I think it's 1982 uh, and has expired in 2015. How, how that might be the source of some of the, the concerns that the chairman has articulated. And, and while the softwood lumber agreement is outside of NAFTA, what is the nexus to NAFTA? <clears throat> Um, and then finally, the role of technology uh, and automation, artificial intelligence in job losses vis-a-vis -vis globalization. Because they, I, I've seen some pretty credible studies that suggest that job losses occasioned uh, by globalization or, uh, or free trade agreements really pale in comparison to the amount of jobs that have been lost um, as a result of increased efficiency, productivity, and, and more importantly, robotics, artificial intelligence, et cetera. Thank you for that question, Mr. Chairman. I was under the impression you wanted to be out of here by 11. Right. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, thank, you, no, so thank you for that question. And thank you in particular for volunteering me for softwood lumber duty. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so on the softwood lumber question, Mr. White, I, I hear in your voice the frustration, uh, which, is, which is, I think, the frustration that uh, is commonly heard any time a market is opened and new products come in and, and effects are felt, as the chairman says, um, locally. Um, my understanding, and, and the software lumber issue, uh, we have, you know, a, an entire generation, two generations at this point, of trade lawyers in Washington who've made an entire career out of litigating software lumber with Canada. <clears throat> wow. The dispute uh, predates NAFTA by a number of years. Um, and in fact, uh, the, the issue, as I understand it, is not so much about tariffs at the border. Uh, we're not talking about taxes that are charged when softwood lumber crosses the border in one direction or the other. We're talking about, um, in effect, severance taxes. They're called stumpage fees. It's how much the, the, the timber company pays to the province in Canada. It's a provincial matter, not a federal matter. Um, how much the, 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 the timber company pays to the province when it cuts down a tree. Um, and the, the allegation from the United States is that those rates are unnaturally low and that therefore they represent a subsidy to Canadian softwood lumber. <clears throat> and the case uh, has unfolded uh, over a number of years. I think that the principal nexus to NAFTA is that NAFTA gave us an additional, an additional tool with which to pursue the case. Uh, and um, uh, Canada had made, in the context of the U.S.-Canada Free Trade Agreement and the U.S. Uh, and, and NAFTA, 
a series of commitments in principle, uh, not necessarily relating specifically to softwood lumber, but in principle. Uh, and, and we felt, the United States has felt over the years that, that the handling of softwood lumber in Canada violates those commitments um, in principle. I think, the, I think the record of that um, uh, litigation has been mixed. We've won on some points and lost on other points. Um, at the end of the day, Canada is a very large country. Uh, with very large number of trees, uh, and therefore, in some ways, has a comparative advantage in the comp in the production of softwood lumber that we can never overcome. Uh, and so, um, you've you've seen the efforts by in different in different uh, different administrations and different political uh, constellations to try to address the problem. It's a stubborn problem. The Canadians uh, will generally ha uh, hide behind provincialism, um, federalism, and say, "Well, that's a provincial matter. We we, don't, we can't control it at the federal level." Uh, we do that too uh, in other areas. So it's a it's a tough issue. NAFTA, I think, uh, is is part of the res part of the answer. I hope part of the answer to the problem. Um, but it's obviously a tough issue that's a perennial and is probably not going away anytime soon. Um, on the broader questions that you asked, Mr. Chairman, um, I think I, I was seeing data recently off the top of my head, uh, don't, don't hold me to these specific numbers, but orders of magnitude, uh, something like 85% of the job loss uh, that, we've, that we've experienced over the last decade or so has been as a result of technological innovation. Of the remaining 15%, um, uh, most of it has to do with uh, kind of entrepreneurial failure to keep up with the market, uh, and a very small share actually relates to specific trade agreements. Um, you'll, you'll recall that when NAFTA was passed, when the Central America Free Trade Agreement was passed uh, 10 years ago, in general, when, it, when a major trade measure is before the U.S. Congress, it's usually paired with some form of trade adjustment assistance. Um, the, the, it's, it's Paired, if not in, in terms of the legislative vehicle, it, the two will come before the Congress very close together in time. Uh, and so there have been efforts to um, use federal funding to support the states in helping uh, communities and sectors that are negatively impacted by trade to adjust to those impacts. There's generally been some form of assistance in retraining. Sometimes there's been uh, an attempt to help people move if they felt they needed to move to a different part of the state or a different part of the country uh, for a job opportunity. Um, the programs in general have been uh, disparate because they're carried out by the states, not by the federal government, so that's natural and appropriate, but they have had differential effects in different states depending on how they've been, how effectively they've been carried out. <clears throat> And at least in some guises, um, one of the problems with TAA is that it has required a certification from the Department of Labor or the Department of Commerce uh, that the company in question or the jobs in question have in fact been lost as a result of trade. Uh, that's a difficult thing for the federal government to do because it has to in effect certify that its policies cost you your job. Uh, and so it is, um, it's not an easy certification to secure. It makes the program more difficult to use. And I think um, uh, an, an, an obvious response to the anxiety that we're seeing regarding trade and globalization in our country is to do a better job uh, of, that, of that kind of uh, what I would call structural adjustment assistance, which, um, which as I say, we have not really committed to. I think in, in, in general, our view, uh, has been that the market should sort those things out, uh, and the market should should determine how much a company's worth and how much a piece of real estate's worth and how much a, a worker is worth, uh, and and the market has done that. Uh, it's the problem is that it has determined that workers in some parts of the country are worth significantly less than they were before the process started. So I think um, I think a conversation about how we could do a better job of mitigating those impacts would be would be useful and would help. Uh, uh, mitigate some of these concerns that we're seeing. Gonzalez. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Rooney, for your wonderful testimony. What I uh, specifically appreciated is how you opened with the story of former President Bush and how political um, gestures are very symbolic to creating um, the environment and, and policy, really. And so thank you for that. I, I love stories. I'm a big storyteller myself, so I appreciated that. <laughs> In your presentation, you were talking about NAFTA and the economic impacts um, to the state and the country, et cetera. 
you also in your presentation, which I saw but didn't get, you didn't speak to, was the role of immigrants into mm -hmm. our state, into our country. What I worry about sometimes is we silo off these conversations. We silo, silo off NAFTA mm -hmm. to um, and not talk about immigrants, to not talk about political discourse and we talk, um, that is coming and the symbolic role that these conversations have. And I think they're all interconnected. Um, in your expert opinion, what are your thoughts in regards to, um, to how these things really inform each other per, um, and, and affect each other? Thank you for that question, Ms. Gonzalez, Madam Chair. Um, that's a, that's a great point, and I think uh, we have tried, at least in our little way in the Bush Center, to, uh, to in fact, avoid that siloization um, and, and make a presentation. You, you'll also find it um, on our website, bushcenter.org slash immigration. Uh, of, we've done a series of monographs, statistical, um, uh, really statistical handbook. It's a, it started out as a physical little booklet with uh, statistics and graphs in it about how immigrants impact the economy of the United States. Uh, and, I mean, particularly in a situation where you see our demographic curve as a country uh, flattening, flattening off, uh, you do wonder uh, who's going to pay for your Social Security, uh, uh, if, if not immigrants and their children. Uh, and so uh, I think we believe that immigrants uh, have had a strongly positive effect on the economy of the United States. Um, and, and in general, if you look at, have a look at that booklet, it's now available online um, on our website. You know, the proportion of major companies that were founded by immigrants, the proportion of um, uh, patents that are filed by immigrants, the, uh, the, 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 the average educational level of immigrants as opposed to native-born population, immigrants are, are a net plus. It is true that <clears throat> the uh, proportion of foreign-born persons in this country has reached a level that we have not seen since a century ago, uh, and and so that is uh, that is worth considering. A century ago, that fact uh, you know contributed to uh, some some things that were not so pretty in our in our history. So it's worth it's worth considering how we deal with that fact. But the but the effort to think holistically about this set of problems is you're you're right on target about that. We will actually uh, have an announcement later this month. Uh, in fact, on April 18th, we'll be making an announcement of, a, of, a, of an effort to do more to uh, overcome that siloization and think holistically about how we uh, restore American global leadership in economic affairs, beginning at home and, uh, and restoring our ability to lead uh, in integrating the global economy and, and creating the wealth that that, that, that triggers. Well, um, I look forward to reading that. Um, I, I think that that's really important, and we need some strategic leadership in regards to that area. So I, please send it to my office. I also think that having this holistic conversation allows us to think about the people, human beings who are really impacted by whether it's the rhetoric or whether it's the policy decisions or the trade agreements. Like we can talk about these things in the abstract. At the end of the day, these are people's lives. These are people's jobs. These are, this is the way people put food on the table. And so I really appreciate the work that you're doing and I look forward to talking to you some more. Thank you. So that wasn't a question, but with your opinion, with your permission, Madam Chair, just to note briefly, uh, we will be uh, hosting, President Bush will be presiding over a naturalization ceremony later this year, I think in September, to, to precisely make that point and to underscore the, the human Fantastic. dimension of what we're talking about when we talk about immigration. Thank you. Members? Uh, Mr. Chair, Chairman? Thank you. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Again, your testimony was uh, really super. Appreciate you being here very much. I just had a pretty more of a technical question, I guess, with regard to the issues that are uh, outstanding, so to speak, on the table that hopefully get resolved uh, here rapidly. Um, with regard to rules of origin for autos, and specifically the unique approach that, uh, that the Trump administration now has come up with, very creative and sound like an excellent idea, to look at these differentiated wage levels. Can you just elaborate on that for another moment, if you don't mind, give us more background? Thank you, uh, Mr. Parker, Madam Chair. Thank you for that question. Um, so I think, in a way, the, the challenge that we face with respect to NAFTA is that um, the, the model, the kind of economic model that NAFTA was designed to make real and implement um, told us that, in general, it tells us that when you open a market uh, across a border, any kind of border, um, the, the prices for things will tend to equalize. So uh, trade across international boundaries essentially takes place when, when, there are, when the 
when the relative costs of production on the different sides of the border are different. Um, and, and, and over time, those relative, that, that difference in the relative cost should narrow and, and should become uh, to the point where it's only represents essentially transportation costs and transaction costs and other kind of ancillary things. So I say all that because uh, in 1994, uh, Mexican industrial wages were a tiny fraction of American industrial wages. Today, they are a less tiny fraction, but they're still just a fraction of American uh, manufacturing wages. So that process of convergence hasn't really taken place, or it hasn't, it hasn't, it hasn't resulted in, in, uh, in an, an elimination of that difference. And I think that, that, that has roots in the, rec in the Mexican labor market. It has roots in the Mexican labor movement. It has, it, has, it has complex roots that are not as simple as simply saying, you guys need to raise your, raise your wages. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, there has been a, a remarkable increase in manufacturing productivity in Mexico during that same period. Um, and so the productivity has grown faster than wages. Uh, and, and therefore, there is a sense in which there is a rent being captured by the investor when the investor moves production to Mexico and can pay those lower wages because the productivity level would actually justify a significantly higher wage in Mexico. Perhaps not the U.S. level because productivity in Mexico is still below U.S. productivity, but certainly higher than the wage that exists. So the attempt to kind of push an increase in manufacturing wages in Mexico is not misguided. Um, whether you can force it by making it a matter of customs enforcement is, is a question in my mind. That's the kind of thing that requires documentation. That's the kind of thing that invites fraud. Uh, and therefore, it can be very, very difficult to police. The discussion that took place earlier about the role of labor in the agreement I think is, in, is important in this respect because when NAFTA was negotiated, um, labor and environmental conditions were not uh, a part of the original negotiation. The side letters that address labor and environment were negotiated subsequent to the signature of NAFTA before it was approved by the US Congress. Uh, and those two side agreements are outside the agreement, as it were. You can't, you can't make a complaint about Mexican labor conditions under NAFTA and enforce it by withdrawing trade benefits. In subsequent trade agreements, the Central America Free Trade Agreement, uh, for example, the U.S. Columbia Free Trade Agreement, the U.S. Panama Free Trade Agreement, that changed and those provisions were brought into the heart of the agreement where if you have a, if you have a, uh, and, and the United States is pursuing a case like this with Guatemala under the Central America Free Trade Agreement where we believe, the U.S. government believes, uh, I was one of those that believed it, so the U.S. government believed it, um, that labor, labor conditions in Guatemala uh, are designed by the government to inhibit um, labor from engaging in effective collective bargaining. So that's a way of suppressing wages. But CAFTA, Central America Free Trade Agreement, gives us a tool that we can use to police that. And we can enforce, we can, if we can, you know, you take that to arbitration, you win arbitration, you can withdraw trade benefits in order to enforce a judgment. And NAFTA, you can't do that. So the, the idea of bringing labor into, the, into NAFTA in the current negotiation is to embed it in the heart of the agreement where disputes like that can be taken and can be made effective. I think the allegation is, I don't, I don't assert that this is true, but I think the allegation is that in part because of that weak labor commitment under, between the U.S. and Mexico under NAFTA, the Mexican labor movement has not been able to organize itself in a way that's effective to ensure that it gets its share, in, in effect, uh, of that increase in productivity. And so my own view is that that's a more effective way over time to cure the, this kind of distortion in wage rates between the U.S. and Mexico more effective than trying to make customs officers enforce it uh, when a car enters the United States. But in any case, the, the, the idea is not necessarily out of bounds. Very good. And one other item, uh, just again, the, the final, I guess, item that's outstanding, so to speak, uh, dealing with the sunset clause. Um, I know uh, the concern of the business community with regard to predictability and five years or so, obviously not uh, adequate to have 
proper long-term uh, investment horizons. I know the governor agrees that with that, and uh, I know many of us do. Uh, what are your thoughts on where we'll settle out on that? Uh, do you think there'll be some, uh, you know, some maybe a, a longer horizon, uh, 20 years or 25 years or something like that, or do you think we'll ultimately we'll end up without any type of uh, sunset clause? Gosh, you know, that's that's a matter ultimately for for Ambassador Lighthizer and the president to figure out how much they're willing to give on that. Um, my, I think one of the things that drives that, um, drives that request from the U.S. is that NAFTA, NAFTA calls for the governments to meet at ministerial level periodically to review implementation of the agreement and to, to address issues that might arise as, the, as, the, as, as events unfold. That ministerial commission has, to my knowledge, never met. Or if it has met, it was once or twice in the very beginning. Uh, and it became, um, I mean, it's difficult to prepare. It's, you put it on the schedule, and all of a sudden you have to have things to say. And it's, it's, you know, it kind of invites controversy. You know, if things are going along, all three governments kind of seeing, well, things are going along, why would we you know, kind of invite controversy by holding that meeting? So it's been very difficult to schedule that meeting. And so um, my, my hope would be that in, in, in lieu of a hard sunset clause, we we, we arrive at a strengthened provision for that kind of review and, 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 and use, I don't know how you'd enforce it, but, but make it so that the, the three governments actually meet in an effective way to review implementations of the agreement so that issues like this involving labor or other things can be floated at that kind of more technical level before they become emotional. That, that I think, would be, would be a good outcome. That would be good for the agreement, good for the, good for the... Uh, Good for the regional economy and and good and better for the country. for the whole agreement, um, but um, I'm not the negotiator. Yeah, very good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Senator, uh, thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, one quick question, and it's a question that I that you kind of just addressed uh, when you were talking about labor and environmental provisions being brought into the body of the agreement, uh, and uh, I, I, your next to last slide listed that as one of the stated negotiating objectives. My question is simple. Has it, in fact, been brought into the body of the agreement? I noticed you didn't list that as some of the remaining uh, issues outstanding. Uh, so uh, thank you, Senator. Madam mm -hmm. Chair, thank you for the opportunity to address that question. I think um, the, the, the motto of a trade negotiator is that nothing is agreed until everything is agreed. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so a lot of things have, have been discussed across the table over the last seven or eight months. Text has been drafted. Everybody kind of knows, I think, where the final outcome will be in certain areas. Mm -hmm. But, it, but everybody will, nobody will say, well, yes, we've agreed to that. So, so I don't know the specific answer to okay. your question. Uh, but I think it's not that, that idea um, is not terribly controversial. Uh, mm -hmm. Mexico agreed to that in the TPP process, for example, binding commitments on labor and environment. So I don't think that that is a terribly controversial idea in principle. The exact specifics, you know, have to be worked out. What exactly mm -hmm. um, is the process for taking a, a labor dispute to dispute to, to settlement under the agreement and so on? Yeah. There's some devils in those details, yeah. but I think that principle is, is taken for granted. Well, well, thank you for that, and I, I appreciate you having articulated why it's important to have it in the body of the agreement if we're going to modernize it. Uh, and thank you for all the work that the Institute does around these issues. Uh, great work. Thank Appreciate you, sir. your testimony. Thank you, sir. Any other questions? Thank you so much thank for you being much, here. Your testimony has been incredibly informative. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Our next witness is Renee Lara. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Um, actually, there's several chairmen, Chairman Moody, uh, Chairman White, Chairman Parker, future chairman, current chairman, Lena Ortega, um, maybe some future speakers, uh, Senator Rodriguez. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak uh, to you um, about the labor perspective on this issue. And as it turns out, some of the questions uh, from our previous speaker ended up in this uh, subject area, and so I wish to not repeat some of them, uh, but I do want to uh, shed light uh, 
in regards to our position, uh, the position of the Texas AFL-CIO. My name is Rene Lara, uh, and I wish to represent our position, but also um, we have uh, advice and uh, background provided to us by our national um, affiliate, the uh, AFL-CIO. And you heard from our uh, trade expert, Celeste Drake, at your hearing about a year ago. Um, <clears throat> Uh, she was not able to be here today, so you, you get me. But I'm a native from El Paso, and so I'm glad to have uh, been given the opportunity to come and uh, visit my hometown. Um, we represent about a quarter of a million members uh, among our affiliates. At the national level, there's uh, 12 and a half million union members uh, in the uh, United States. Now, some of the affiliated unions are more concerned about trade than others. And among them are the United Steelworkers, the International Association of Machinists, um, the uh, Communication Workers, and the United Auto Workers. And these unions throughout American history help make this country the um, industrial powerhouse that it has been. And we hope to not lose that status, but we've seen, we've seen a definite uh, downslide. And so we want to express our concerns uh, about uh, uh, NAFTA in this case and about China um, and their dumping of steel. Now, to make it clear, we are not in opposition to trade. Um, what we say it might sound a little trite, but we say that we are not against trade, we are against unfair trade. And by unfair, we mean unfair to the worker. Um, we have problems with the rules governing trade, but not trade itself. And if NAFTA, if we were to withdraw from that agreement, it would not end trade. Uh, it would um, end the current rules governing trade. Which, by the way, our official position is that we want to improve uh, NAFTA. We don't want to end it. Um, but if it isn't improved uh, in one, well, several critical uh, uh, aspects of it, I think that we would be prepared to support withdrawal of it. Uh, our position is actually uh, one of the more moderate positions. The uh, Republican Party of Texas has actually called for the immediate withdrawal uh, from NAFTA, um, but we wish to improve it. So we support trade uh, and all the benefits that are derived. Now, we don't argue uh, the fact that it has cost, uh, NAFTA has caused prosperity. It has brought, um, uh, it has increased productivity. It has, um, provided increased profits. Um, our issue is with how those benefits have been distributed. And we feel that workers have, have not, um, on either side of the border, gained the benefits uh, of NAFTA. And in fact, in some parts of their economy, in the uh, um, American heartland, for example, there have been acute impacts related to um, trade. And uh, we count about 900,000 jobs lost. Uh, um, as a result of um, NAFTA since its inception in 1994. On the Mexican side, um, we see that workers right across the border, and we can just um, drive over and find that maquiladora workers earn a pittance, and the previous speaker referred uh, to the lack of labor standards on the Mexican side, uh, $6 a day in some cases, I think, definitely is not enough to make a living uh, for anyone. So again, I think this uh, goes to the issue of the uh, relationship between productivity and wage gains. Uh, between 1950 and 1980, productivity and wage gains were closely tied. Since then, um, they, they have not, the graph shows that they've um, grown in a, at a disparate level. And so, what that means to us is that the workers have not shared in the benefits of NAFTA overall. Now, the National FLCIO has provided over 50 recommendations uh, on NAFTA. I don't have all of those, but I'll give you the highlights. One of the problems that we have with it is, is the dispute resolution. Uh, uh, it's called the Investor to State Dispute Settlement process, which implements a private sector um, arbitration extrajudicial body uh, to resolve um, Complaints from investors um, when they complain with um, they complain against the uh, governmental laws or rules that are passed. Now, uh, probably the problem we, we well we have several problems with that, uh, but one of the issues is that laborers don't have an an equivalent um, efficient 
uh, process to resolve disputes that they may have. And this goes to the issue of why Mexican uh, law or the Mexican government um, and the labor across the border has not uh, uh, been able to raise their, their, their wages. And uh, the previous speaker did allude to the fact that in 2007, there was what we call the May 10th Agreement um, that sought to provide enforceable provisions in trade agreements. And, and there was the case of Guatemala. There were six uh, unions, and the National FLCIO joined them in uh, uh, complaining about the lack of uh, bargaining rights and uh, collective bargaining rights and uh, the freedom of association, we, we, we felt that we had a slam dunk. And it took nine years to resolve that case, so we felt that that was not, even that was not a, an appropriate avenue to find relief. Uh, the standard, the legal standard to meet was set too high, and so um, that is an inadequate um, way to resolve issues relating to and We find that in other uh, Central American countries, and even in Mexico, there's um, issues where um, we even now, currently, we find issues, um, labor unrest, and um, workers not being able to uh, resolve the fact that they've been denied uh, basic uh, labor rights. So we have a lot of um, other recommendations. Current currency manipulation is one of them. Rules rules of origin we touched on a little bit. Uh, there's the issue of procurement obligations, and we feel that those should be eliminated. Um, the last legislative session, we had a the, t the legislature, thanks to y'all, passed a Buy American Steel uh, bill, which gives preferences to U.S. Uh, steel. And in that regard, um, we feel that uh, well, especially the United uh, Steel Workers have felt that their industry has been particularly hit. And it's been by design. And China has been the leading government that has led that um, uh, very belligerent, we feel, um, approach to, to our industry. Now, China has made it very clear that they want to expand their global markets. And steel, the steel market is one of them. And they have every right to do so, but uh, but we have found um, the U.S. Commerce Secretary uh, issued a report, and they found what our unions have been uh, expressing for a long time is that they've been under attack uh, in terms of uh, the dumping of cheap steel into the U.S. market, and this is not a small matter because steel is critical to national defense. It's a matter of national security. Um, and so we find that the actions that China has undertaken have been predatory. And we felt it personally, uh, in the case of the United Steelworkers, their headquarters were hacked into uh, by the Chinese government. Uh, and this is not just an allegation. The um, US attorney for the Western District of Pennsylvania actually issued an indictment to that fact. So the fact that the Chinese government has been very aggressive and belligerent in their approach to um, taking over certain uh, markets um, has been well documented. So I, th I think uh, previous speakers have alluded, I think our first speaker said that uh, they consider China a foe. Well, in this regard, the Chinese government is a foe. Um, and so now we're kind of in a situation now where we're, there's, we're going back and forth in terms of tariffs. Um, Chairman Anchia, you mentioned automation and uh, that is a problem that we see getting worse. Uh, so we want to anticipate problems in the future. This is an area to consider, not just in this committee relating to trade, but the legislature uh, in general. Automation is taking off at unprecedented levels, artificial intelligence, robotics. Um, and so what that means is that um, you know, the, We've seen technological innovation before, but not to the degree that we're seeing it right now. It's it's very impressive, and, and of course in Austin, uh, it's a high tech city um, where, by the way, a lot of El Pasoans, El Pasoans work. We feel that the job loss relating relating to that um, could dwarf job losses relating to trade, uh, and so we need to anticipate for that. How, what do we do with the workers who lose? You know, drivers who, you know, if you have driverless vehicles, no need for them. Um, you know, checkout counters, uh, even uh, line cooks could lose their jobs. So we need to anticipate. Now, that doesn't mean that 
workers have not been victims of um, the trade agreements. And we can't deny that either. So anything, um, the US Congress is aware of that. At least uh, there's a, a whole list of, I think I've passed this out, list of uh, Congress folks who are very concerned about NAFTA and specifically uh, the suppression of wages and, and the lack of labor rights. And I hope that you uh, get to read this short um, um, letter from Congress. Um, I could answer any other questions you may have, uh, but uh, again, thank you for uh, allowing us to express our uh, position on the, uh, on the issue of uh, North American Free Trade Agreement. Representative Gonzalez. Um, Thank you, Ch Chairwoman, and thank you, Renee, for being here. Um, you're from my district, so we love you a lot, and we want you to come back home. But I wanted to say thank you for bringing up the complexities and touching in with how it can impacts real people's lives. Again, I spoke about this earlier. You really talked about how we think about this, again, in economic terms, and not to say that economic terms don't impact people's lives, but the reality is, is that people who have worked in the maquiladoras, for example, there's been hundreds of women who have been killed in femicide um, in, in Juarez or on the border land area, border area because we haven't put in some some things that maybe um, could protect people and so thank you for bringing up the complexities thank you for saying that we need to take center people in any negotiations that happen in the future and particularly people who are the most vulnerable which happens to be sometimes our workers um, women um, people with disabilities and all those things into consideration as we work to uh, not completely dismantle now um, not, not to have completely dismantled NAFTA, but to strengthen it for all of us. So thank you for that. And thank you for providing us uh, the information as to the, uh, I guess, the items that you believe are the criteria that need to be worked on with regard to NAFTA. Any other, Mr. Chairman? Thank you, Madam Chair. Rene, thank you for your testimony today. Uh, I had an opportunity to um, serve at a, uh, on a panel in Canada uh, with uh, Celeste Drake, and uh, she's, a, she's a very effective advocate. Um, there, there are two issues I want to ask you about. One is uh, the one I alluded to earlier, which was trade adjustment assistance. I, I, I feel that's one place that we've let workers down. Um, Post-NAFTA, we uh, did not have a robust enough mechanism for dealing with people who are adversely impacted by trade. Um, it, there, there's no question that uh, when, when the negative impacts of trade are felt, they're felt very definitely and acutely, and uh, trade adjustment assistance is a way to, to ease that blow, ne never to get rid of it, but ease people back into the workforce when they've lost their jobs. Do you all have recommendations on what we could be doing on trade adjustment? Uh, that would help workers get back on their feet more quickly? Um, trade adjustment assistance has been a, a proposed solution to the ills of job loss, for example, since the beginning, you know, since um, NAFTA first was instituted and probably before that. Um, but that's a very inadequate mechanism. Um, we need to get to the heart of the matter, and that is that um, workers need uh, real uh, labor rights, uh, the ability to bargain collectively. Um, you know, Representative um, uh, uh, Chairman White mentioned this in the sense of, in, the, in terms of the Canadian and uh, 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 forest industry, you know, system is rigged. Well, we feel the system is rigged in terms of uh, labor rights. The International Labor Organization has uh, a list of very core basic uh, labor rights, including the ability to bargain collectively and freedom of association. And it's it's the the uh, private industry, the governments, actors, whoever it is in Latin American countries who try to prevent workers from um, exercising the influence that they can only that they can only uh, exercise collectively. And so when the system is rigged in that regard, um, then you won't, it, it, no matter how much trade adjustment assistance you provide, you're not going to fundamentally fix the system. Um, in the United States, we actually, you know, feel like, you know, we have um, um, a disadvantage exercising our rights. And the Canadians have actually pointed that out. They've said um, that, that the right to work laws uh, in the United States that prevent um, labor unions from um, 
from existing um, at the at the level and 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 having an impact at the level it should, um, they they propose that those be done away with as part of this uh, negotiation process. So we need to get to the core um, of what really hampers um, laborers, and that is the ability to organize and speak collectively. And so, you know, we're only wanting to do what every other type of organization wants, uh, even the chambers of commerce where um, um, actors join together to l leverage a greater amount of influence, um, and in this case, to raise wages, uh, raise benefits, health insurance, pensions, uh, and improve their working conditions. Senator, um, thank you, Renee, for, for your testimony and for uh, giving us a good list of, of um, right improvements to NAFTA that would uh, address some of the concerns some of us have raised about labor, environmental protections, and the rest of it. I, I just wanted to touch on that trade adjustment assistance uh, because of the experience that we had here in El Paso with it after NAFTA was enacted. As we all know, we lost a, a lot of uh, garment workers here in El Paso and as well as in San Antonio with uh, Levi's Strauss companies down there at the time. And there were millions of dollars of trade adjustment assistance uh, provided to us and down in San Antonio and other border communities. Our experience here in El Paso, at least from my direct involvement with that issue and my wife Carmen uh, representing some of those garment workers, was that a lot of them were being given English classes, uh, but no job transferable skills training which is presumably what the idea was behind the trade adjustment assistance so that people who were being displaced out of jobs would be able to transfer into some other jobs where they had acquired some, some training and skills for. And to a large degree, that did not happen from our uh, review of that in, in litigation that took place both here in El Paso and in San Antonio. And so I think that trade adjustment assistance, I agree with you. It, it's, it doesn't get to the root of the, of the problems that we face with, with uh, the labor provisions of NAFTA, but to the extent that it is offered as a means of addressing displacement of workers, uh, there needs to be, it seems to me, uh, some more uh, review of the technical assistance that's actually provided and how that's provided to address some of the shortcomings that we saw here in El Paso. I wonder if, if you all have looked at that side of the, the technical assistance. Thank you. Um, well, that, you know, I think that gets to the question um, Chairman Anshia has asked, and, at, and the, the question is, is there, is there another way, an additional way, we would, in, um, to address uh, the issue of workers who are displaced and, and I think this is something that we need to work uh, on together, but there needs to be a willingness to have all the parties um, uh, resolve this issue uh, together and not just look at business, uh, for example, which is commonly done at the Tex Texas legislature. Um, we are willing to propose different uh, avenues, and again, we know the problem. We've defined the problem. Um, um, we, we have evidence of it. I think the facts are irrefutable in many cases. Um, there will be um, a, an issue, there, well, there is an issue of, of wages not keeping up with productivity, but it may get worse in terms of automation. And so trade adjustment assistance may be a part of it, um, but there could be other solutions. Uh, we propose that part of that menu of solutions uh, also include uh, the ability of workers to have some leverage uh, in, in advocating for their position for rising wages in the private sector and government and all aspects of the economy. Well, th thank you for your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Thank you for your testimony. Um, it was testimony that it's great to have different perspectives, and that certainly offered a different perspective on the part of labor and the worker. Thank you. Thank you. Next person we'd like to call is Myra Maldonado. And we should say, even though we were scheduled to adjourn at 11, we still have some play, time, play where we could go up to 11.30. Oh, okay, that's okay. great. 
Okay, so Madam um, Chairman and uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, good morning. I have a presentation today. Thank you so much. Let me see how can I... Your name and your affiliation, please, sure. for the record. Sure. I'm Mayra Maldonado uh, from the Hunt Institute for Global Competitiveness at the University of Texas El Paso. Thank you. Thank you. On behalf of the Hunt Institute um, for Global Competitiveness at the University of Texas El Paso, I'm honored to address important topics before this committee today, such as the critical role that NAFTA has had for the growth and expansion of the Texas economy, as well as the negative impact that a withdrawal from this trade agreement and steel tariffs could have. Texas is a state that trades. Texas is a national and international leader in trade and the growth and vitality of the Texas economy is critically reliant on this trade. Recent events at the federal level have generated serious threats to Texas trading relationships. On the one hand, the state of NAFTA and its renegotiation are uncertain, and on the other hand, President Trump has applied steel and other tariffs to a variety of countries and products, including, most importantly, steel. While Canada and Mexico's steel exports to the U.S. are initially exempted from this decision, this exemption may expire on May 1st if progress is not made on NAFTA. I'm going to focus my remarks today to hard data that tells the story of what impact a withdrawal from NAFTA or brought on an unexpected steel tariffs would have on the Texas economy. I can tell you upfront the potentially, that the potential impact is, is severe, it is negative, and that Texas businesses and political communities should be doing everything they can to preserve NAFTA's essential components. Oh, let me, yes, okay. So let's start by looking at the role that trade plays in Texas economy. It is hard to believe, but back in 1993, when NAFTA was signed, the US trade with Mexico at the binational level was only $100 billion. Today, Texas alone trades more than $180 billion with Mexico half of it being exports. As you can see, Texas is the top exporting state. Mexico represents a huge percentage of Texas total exports market, 40%. In fact, together, Mexico and Canada represent nearly 50% of our state's exports market. Last year, trade with NAFTA partners brought roughly 120 million billion in revenues into our state. Our next biggest trading partner, China, runs a distant third. If we compare this chart uh, with this other one, Texas runs a trade surplus with, uh, with both Mexico and Canada. Overall, our share of foreign imports is quite modest and tells a different story about Canada and Mexico draining our resources. Looking at foreign direct investment, the numbers tell a similar story. Our strong relationship with our NAFTA partners has created opportunities for Texas investors, both overseas and at home. You see that more than 16,000 jobs have been created by our foreign direct, direct investment in Canada and Mexico alone. I would note that this represents just a small number of Texas workers that rely on NAFTA. In his recent letter to Ambassador Lighthizer, our governor said that NAFTA supports more than a million jobs in our state. So wh what are we sending overseas? Um, don't even bother in trying to understand uh, the, the, the names of these products, it's difficult. But here we have Texas top 10 export commodities. Most of, of our top exports are related to crude oil and natural gas, and guess what? Natural gas is demand, uh, demand is growing at a very rapid pace in Mexico, and with it, ne Texas natural gas exports. Mexico now imports 75% of its natural gas from the United States, with nearly 80% of that amount coming from Texas. 65% of all the gasoline demand in Mexico is imported by the, is, in, in, is, coming, is going from the United States. And 100% of the gasoline demand in Juarez is coming from uh, Texas refineries. So all the gasoline uh, in, in, in Ciudad Juarez is from Texas. 
As for these other categories of motor vehicle parts, plastic products, computer equipment, and the like, I will note that more than 80% of Texas exports go to our NAFTA partners. Here we have our top imported commodities. In NAFTA, NAFTA has transformed production lines. Uh, often this means that products move back and, and forth across the border several times on their way before reaching the final consumers. In some industries, as much as 40% of the parts in Mexico imports are actually American. Now, one trade topic uh, that has dominated the, the headlines recently is the question of steel and aluminum tariffs. Uh, President Trump has announced new tariffs of 25% for steel and 10% for alum uh, aluminum imports. And again, Texas tends to lose in this scenario. Our state accounts for a quarter of all steel brought into the United States. And the next state, Illinois, doesn't, um, it imports less than half that amount. If we take a, a look by country, um, so we see that so far these tariffs have not been imposed on steel for Canada and Mexico, but again, we will see what happens after May 1st. Even so, our NAFTA trading partners sell us about 25% of the steel we buy from overseas. So already Texas manufacturers are feeling the impact of the new tariffs. My last few slides look at the data around some of the claims made about the need for new tariffs or the need to blow up NAFTA. We hear, for example, that the existing trade system has cost the US jobs. Of course, there are shifts as industries realign. But since decades ago, uh, the United States and Texas have seen steady job growth. But what about then uh, the purchasing power of Americans? We demonstrate here that per capita income adjusted per inflation has been up in Texas and in the United States. Something else uh, we often hear is that our trade deals have caused manufacturing jobs to move overseas. Has the manufacturing employment rank? Indeed. But what are the driving forces behind this shift in employment? If anything, uh, the manufacturing sector is producing more than ever, even as, if, if, even as it employs fewer workers. Therefore, technology and automation of manufacturing processes is what's driving manufacturing job losses, job, not NAFTA. I will finalize my remarks saying that when NAFTA opened borders, it opened the door to thousands of business opportunities and Texas seized the moment. We have transformed these opportunities into tens of billions of, of dollars every year and upwards of a million jobs for Texans. If the US withdraws from NAFTA, all of these gains are at risk as is the stability of hundreds of Texan companies, the experiences of millions of Texas consumers who like lower pri prices and the security of thousands of Texas overseas investments. On behalf of the Hunt Institute, I urge the Texas legislature and the committee members here today to do what you can to preserve the economic benefits that have come to our state because of NAFTA. I would be happy to take any questions. No, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Michael Pacheco. Good morning, members. Um, my name is Mike Pacheco, for, uh, representing the Texas Farm Bureau here today. Um, before I start, I'd also like to say uh, I'm from El Paso, so I'm happy to be back and happy to see so many chairmen uh, from different committees that were able to make it out and, and see what El Paso has to offer and what's going on here. Um, that being said, I'll get into my testimony. Um, I'll try to keep this short. I know there's some folks behind me still, and we're running short on time. Uh, just to remind you, Texas Farm Bureau is the largest general agricultural organization in the state. We represent roughly 520,000 members in Texas. Um, and trade is very, very important to, to our members and, and to our industry. Um, it's estimated that roughly uh, $38 billion uh, is, is done due to NAFTA, due to agriculture exports. Uh, that is roughly quadruple uh, what it was prior to NAFTA being introduced in uh, 92, uh, 93, so, excuse me. Um, in 2016, Texas agricultural exports to Mexico totaled approximately $834 million. Our top four exports to Mexico were beef, veal, cotton, sweeteners, and corn. Um, Texas alone, also to Canada, 
was $875 million. So uh, Texas actually sends uh, a little bit more to Canada than, than to Mexico at the end of the day. Um, the top four exports to Canada were horticultural products, uh, beef and veal as well, processed grains, and food preparation. Um, additionally, NAFTA has strongly benefited the U.S. and the Texas economies. U.S. agricultural exports to Canada and Mexico account for uh, over half a million jobs, according to the Center of North American Studies. Texas agricultural exports to these countries employ approximately 19,000 people. Out of those 19,000, it's estimated about 8,000 are farmers and ranchers directly. The other 10,000 are auxiliary jobs uh, to help support those farmers, uh, either get product to market or um, move things as they go through the um, process. Um, there is no doubt that NAFTA has increased the demand for U.S. agricultural goods, lowered input and production costs, and spurred our, spurred our economy. Leaders involved in NAFTA renegotiations must recognize the gains achieved by American agriculture and ensure that trade with Canada and Mexico remains strong. While Texas Farm Bureau recognizes that many achievements of NAFTA, the trade agreement is over two decades old, and we commend the administration for looking at ways to break down existing trade barriers and produce a better deal for America. We welcome any modernization to NAFTA that will further expand market opportunities for farmers and ranchers. It is important to note that the net farm income has dropped 50% just the past four years. This is the largest four-year percentage decrease since the Great Depression, uh, and that is devastating to uh, U.S. producers. Um, so that uh, is very important to keep in mind as a lot of these trade negotiations move forward. Farm economy is already hurting. A lot of farmers and ranchers are already hurting, and the uh, trade market is vital to our producers. Um, that, that's kind of the, the, what I have for my prepared remarks. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. The one thing I'd like to reiterate is that uh, China is our largest export market for agricultural goods. Uh, Canada is second and Mexico is third. So um, keeping in mind NAFTA is very important. Our farmers and uh, ranchers have benefited greatly from it. And it's something that, as I mentioned, as, as we realize that it, it, it's okay for it to be re-looked at, it, it is two decades old. A lot of things have changed as some of the previous speakers have mentioned. Um, we too would, would be okay with making a few adjustments here and there, but the overall principle of, of NAFTA is something that our members very strongly support and hope to keep in place. Uh, happy to answer any questions that, that you all may have. Gonzalez. Yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you, Mike. Uh, and thank you to Farm Bureau for being here and for really always advocating for Texas agriculture. As a vice chairwoman of the Ag Committee, we couldn't do our work in the committee without Farm Bureau, and so we're very grateful for everything that you do. Uh, mm -hmm. And again, I, and this is going to kind of be my theme all day long. These are pe people's lives, particularly farmers' lives. What's happening around the global stage from the United States in regards to trade is impacting our local farmers. And I've gotten a lot, for example, for the members of the committee who aren't from El Paso, El Paso County produces 50% of all the pecans in, um, this, for the state of Texas. And so it's a big deal here in our community ag. It sometimes gets forgotten. What, is, what are you hearing from local farmers regarding the national conversations of tariffs, NAFTA, et cetera, and are people really concerned about their livelihood and ability to continue farming when it's already, I would say, agriculture is at a crossroads, and I, what we do right now, I feel, will impact the ag industry for the next 20 years? Yeah, so um, I'll try to address that in, in, in several different ways, um, uh, Ms. Gonzalez and, and committee. Um, is, is a, the Chairman White alluded to a little bit earlier, you know, when, when certain trade uh, tariffs are put in place, the, and, and Mr. Anchia too, you, they're, they've, they're felt very acutely. So um, NAFTA luckily was left, well, as we know, the administration was looking at NAFTA, but due to the steel and trade uh, tariffs that were first announced, announced, we know that Mexico and Canada were left out as well as the EU, which was a great sigh of relief to a lot of our members that rely on NAFTA. However, when the China uh, tariffs uh, stayed in place and China's first retaliation is what hurt Texas particularly out of those were its nuts, pecans, and our citrus industry down in the valley, which I know you all as a committee were down in the valley just a few weeks ago. Um, some of the numbers are still kind of coming in, and so I'll, I'll, I'll definitely keep you all up to date on what some of those numbers are. But we, we have been hearing from some folks down in the valley and some folks over here in, in far west Texas about, you know, 80, 90 percent of my business is, is producing these things. And even though not all of it may end up in China, that is a growing market for a lot of our producers and something that's very vital to, to their well-being. And so if you can just think about any industry or business that may be losing 40, 50, 30 percent of, of their customer base, that, that has a, a huge effect on, on 
their livelihood. And so, so it, it is a big deal. Well, as Farm Bureau continues to advocate for our local farmers and ranchers, particularly in regards to this issue, please feel free to contact our office. I, I, I want to stay abreast of what's going on. Yes, ma'am. Most definitely. Chairman White. Yes, thank you so much. And thank you so much, uh, Mr. Pacheco, for your um, testimony. Um, I'm intrigued about the, you say, 50% drop in, in farm income over four years. Okay. Yes. I'm intrigued about that. I'd like to know what you believe is the cost of it because uh, listening is some of the testimony. It's, you know, um, our trade with Canada, Mexico, China is so important. We, we, we can't undermine it. But our income has been down for four years. So uh, don't think um, uh, Mr. Trump or President Trump was president four years ago. I don't think a lot of this talk was going on four years ago. But, but we already see this drop. Uh, I think uh, a testimony or two, you know, someone was saying, you know, uh, you know yes, everything's going great with NAFTA, but somebody um, in Central or, or, or South America in this agreement is getting paid $6 an hour, but everything's going great. So um, do, we, do we have a reason why the 50% drop even before all of the, the turbulence in this discussion about NAFTA? Um, it, it's it's so that that's a, a yes sir the um, that fifty percent comes from a, a varied number of course of uh, inputs obviously and in, in different variables uh, there was a huge drought which had a huge effect on it so there's a lot of natural uh, issues that of course every farmer and rancher have to deal with um, and, and so that was was a good chunk of it I can try to figure out where exactly that fifty that drop comes from but overall NAFTA has been a huge net gain for a lot of our our members. Mr. Chair. Just really quickly, uh, Mike, thanks for your testimony. Um, the, the, the reason that your testimony is very important is that um, agriculture is the one thing that, that usually has 100% U.S. content, right? I mean, it is grown here, it is made here, and then we export it. So it is, it is always the target of retaliation when, uh, we want to, when the U.S. wants to impose some sort of tariff the first ones to get hit are agriculture because it's 100% 100 uh, 100 American content and there aren't widgets or component parts from, from other countries. You know, uh, b because automobiles, for example, uh, are largely made in North America with Canadian parts and, and Mexican parts, uh, 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 potentially Asian parts, if you apply a tariff onto a car, you may be hitting your own folks. Right, but with agriculture, it's different. You want to, if you want to in, in, inflict pain on the United States, you do it to ag products. And I know that with the proposed steel tariffs vis-a-vis uh, -vis China, the response has been uh, almost exclusively to ag uh, as 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 a retaliatory measure by China. Talk about uh, some of the concerns that are being articulated by your uh, members. Um, I, I'll try to uh, speak to that. I can, I can speak to it kind of generally, but definitely we'll generally. update it. Yes, sir. Uh, so chairman, uh, chairwoman committee. Um, luckily that, so fortunately for Texas, that first round, we were, we were spared somewhat. Like I said, we, we did get hit with some of the nuts and, and citrus stuff, but out of those 128 items on the first retaliatory list from China, roughly, I feel like a hundred of them were easily, uh, agricultural products. As you know, pork is the one that got a lot of, um, attention. Um, Texas is not a huge pork producer, but we do have pork producers in Texas that are going to feel uh, some of these these tariffs. Um, and so I, I think it's just, uh, you know, anybody who grows any of those products are they're they're concerned. Um, as we know, it's only grown from just what happened earlier this week. Uh, I saw just this morning. Um, President Trump has asked uh, Ambassador Lighthouser to look at another $100 billion worth of tariffs on China. Um, and if once China starts hitting um, corn, uh, sorghum, uh, cattle, beef, um, we're really going to start, Texas is then really going to start feeling the, the, the effects from uh, China's uh, tariffs that they're putting on our products. Wow. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you so much for your testimony. Yes, Thank you, committee. Sophie Torres. Hi, hello. 
My name is Sophie Torres and I'm the Vice President of Government Affairs for the San Antonio Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. Madam Chair Ortega, Chairman Anchia, members of the committee, thank you so much for the opportunity to testify on behalf of our Chairwoman, Erica Prosper Nirenberg, our President and CEO, Ramiro Cavazos, our board and our more than 1,200 members that are part of the San Antonio Hispanic Chamber of Commerce on the ongoing NAFTA renegotiations. For more than 89 years, the San Antonio Hispanic Chamber of Commerce has served as a leading source and advocate for Hispanic businesses, Hispanics in business, and the Hispanic mar market. We were the first Hispanic Chamber in the United States starting in 1928. But because of our longstanding legacy, we understand the importance of strong trade relations, agreements with other global markets, especially with our neighbors in the North and the South. In the early 1990s, the Hispanic Chamber led the efforts of advocacy and collaboration so that this agreement could open trade and economic impact not only in Texas but across our nation. To date, we continue to be vigilant as NAFTA has evolved and created numerous economic opportunities across different business sectors and for all the constituencies involved. Not many people know, but the original signing of NAFTA um, by President H.W. Bush Carlos Salinas de Gortadi of Mexico and Prime Minister Moroni of Canada was actually signed in San Antonio in 1992. Mm -hmm. Since then, San Antonio, Texas, and the countries involved in NAFTA have reaped the benefits of this trade agreement. In a study done by the San Antonio Hispanic Chamber of Commerce Saber Research Institute, analysis indicated that 63,204 direct jobs were created in the San Antonio economy alone because of NAFTA. When the multiplier effect is considered, the total number of jobs generated by NAFTA grew to 135,000, earning an income of $7.2 billion. The increased trading activity due to NAFTA has added $10.6 billion to the San Antonio economy. These additional jobs created through the successful NAFTA implementation are important drivers for the region and, the, and NAFTA. In San Antonio, Texas motor manufacturing is a major economic driver in our community. It's created over 7,300 jobs within their plant and their suppliers. Their suppliers make the parts used in the Toyota, Tacoma, and Tundra trucks assembled in San Antonio. Some of the suppliers house their operations within Mexico. The maquiladoras not only play an important part to produce the Tacoma and Tundra trucks, but also provide middle school jobs for many in Mexico. The steel and aluminum tariffs proposed by the current administration has the potential to be devastating for these suppliers who rely on imported steel and aluminum from other countries. This is just one example. An additional $100 to one supplier can add up to be an additional $2,500 to the cost of the truck if it's multiplied by the 25 different suppliers depending on which truck is used. Ultimately, that additional cost is transferred to consumers, pricing potential customers out of buying the vehicle due to the increased cost. Without NAFTA, the competitiveness we have taken advantage of for so long would no longer exist. The modernization of NAFTA must consider the new way business is conducted today. When NAFTA was first created, the term digital economy didn't exist. The online marketplaces and the app sharing economies were as a thing of science fiction. As the world around us becomes more and more digital, face-to-face -face interactions are not needed to conduct business. E-commerce provision should be proposed as part of NAFTA modernization to promote the free flow of information. At the Chamber recently, we updated our website using one of our members, Carbono Development. Carbono Development is based out of Monterrey, Mexico, has an and has an office in Austin. All their website developers work in Monterrey, while their sales office is in Austin. We handled all of our face-to-face -face meetings regarding redesign, but most of our business was done via Skype and email. This is just a prime example of how the new digital economy has created new opportunities for economic prosperity through the free-flowing information highway. NAFTA has served our, the three countries extremely well, increasing the number of trade done five times over since 1992. Texas shares 1,200 miles of border, common border with our southern neighbor, unifying our economies, histories, and lives. Because of this, many traded goods pass through our state, making the effects of NAFTA much greater for us. 
We are at a point today where we must address today's challenges that affect the North American region while securing the safety and efficient movement of goods. Madam Chair, th members of the committee, thank you so much for your time and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Members, any questions? Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Joseph Heaton. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Joe Heaton, and I am the Director of Federal Affairs for the Beer Institute. Thank you for this opportunity to uh, provide the U.S. beer industry's views on the President's decisions to impose tariffs on aluminum and steel. I speak on behalf of the beer industry, which represents 1.9 percent of our nation's gross domestic product. It's difficult to overstate the impact of the beer industry in the state of Texas. According to our Beer Serves America data, the brewing industry employs or supports over 80,000 jobs in Texas alone. These jobs come in the form of direct brewing jobs, such as those employed at the Anheuser-Busch Brewery in Houston and the Miller Coors Brewery in Fort Worth. They also include importer jobs, such as those workers from Heineken USA that import Tecate into Texas, or Constellation Brands who imports Corona directly through Eagle Pass, Texas, from their Nava Mexico brewery directly into the United States. The administration's decisions to impose tariffs on aluminum is of great concern to the beer industry. A majority of the volume of beer sold in the United States comes in aluminum cans and bottles. In fact, 37 billion aluminum cans and aluminum bottles, to be precise, are used each year. American brewers spend $5 billion on aluminum cans and aluminum beer bottles, which contain approximately $2.7 billion worth of aluminum. In fact, aluminum is the largest, single largest input cost in American beer manufacturing. Some might say that the solution to aluminum problems is to purchase more aluminum can sheet domestically. Fact is, we do. 98% of the can sheet that's used to make aluminum uh, cans and bottles is actually uh, made here in the United States. The problem is that that's not the whole story. You need to use imported primary aluminum to make that can sheet. It's not been enough domestic production of primary aluminum for decades. In fact, the U.S. has been in a deficit position with respect to the manufacture of primary aluminum since the end of World War II. Now, under the new tariffs imposed by the administration, the beer industry must pay an additional cost on this primary aluminum and on that 2% of can sheet that's imported. Simply put, these tariffs are a tax, which hurts the economic activities and the jobs that our industry supports. The administration says that tariffs are necessary to protect U.S. national security. As you recall, that was the justification under which the tariffs were imposed. Imports of primary aluminum for can sheet and beer cans do not impact national security, nor do they threaten national security. U.S. smelters and reliable U.S. trading partners, including many of which where we have positive trading balances, can satisf satisfy the military's demand for its aluminum. The competitive challenges that U.S. smelters face are a result of factors unrelated to imports. Aging facilities, for example, high energy costs, or in, over the past few years, a strong U.S. dollar. The President's decision to impose tariffs has consequences for our industry. According to third-party economists, the tariffs will cost the beer industry $347 million annually and cost over 20,000 jobs. Today there are more than 5,000 active breweries in the United States, and we support over 2.2 million jobs across the country. This tariff, as I said, will likely cause more than, than $20,000 in jo 20, jobs lost. We should protect these jobs in the form of truck drivers, waiters, waitresses, welders, farmers, and your local brewmasters because these jobs are now at risk because of the tariffs that were imposed on March 23rd. Now, we do appreciate the President's commitment to protecting American jobs, and we know that he wants to defend all American workers in, in the, as well as the aluminum industry. Unfortunately, these tariffs disproportionately impact domestic industries like ours that are large users of aluminum. The smelters may benefit in the short term, but it's aluminum users who are hurt in the long term. Considering the impact on just beer alone, as I mentioned, the 10% tariff that was announced on March 23rd means a $347 million impact uh, to U.S. brewers. That's not counting the now additional 25% tariff that was announced uh, on just China specifically. The 10% will be $347 million. That's money that brewers would necessarily use in Houston, for example, at Anheuser-Busch to reinvest in their business. 
Uh, America's brewers and beer importers recently secured a reduction in federal excise taxes as part of uh, the federal government's uh, Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, which passed in December. We secured approximately, as an industry, $130 million in tax savings. Once again, the cost of the tariff is $347 million, more than double the tax relief that we got under the bill, essentially wiping out what we were able to achieve there. From a jobs perspective, as I mentioned, a loss of more than 20,000 jobs that depend on the beer industry. And finally, the uncertainty that these tariffs are injecting into the market. Uh, since the president announced uh, his tariffs, the Midwest premium or the spot price that, uh, that uh, beer companies use to purchase aluminum has skyrocketed, far exceeding the 10% tariff. Um, in fact, I haven't checked the Midwest premium price on aluminum this morning, but before the tariffs were announced, it was approximately seven cents per pound. Uh, earlier this week, it was at 19 cents per pound. Uh, the administration's willingness to consider country exemptions is a good thing. Granting temporary exclusions from the tariff uh, until May 1st to Canada, Mexico, and the European Union, Australia, Argentina, Brazil was a good first step, as these countries provide a very large percentage of the primary aluminum imported in the United States. We want the administration to follow through, though, and complete agreements with these and other aluminum producing countries so that there can be greater marketplace certainty. We also want the administration to address the price gouging that I just talked about, that 7% or 7 cents per pound to 19 cents per pound uh, that have occurred as a result of the tariffs. These changes, we believe, are disconnected from market fundamentals and may increase further without serious attention. Finally, we cannot understand why the administration believes that tariffs are a key to revitalization of U.S. smelters when energy costs are the key factor in driving smelter competitiveness. The U.S. producers are at a severe energy cost disadvantage relative to their foreign competitors. Lower energy costs help smelters and may encourage investment in the U.S. rather than in other countries. While imports of primary aluminum and can sheet do not threaten national security, there are actions the administration could take to facilitate a functioning aluminum market. Further scrutiny of aluminum price irregularities, as I mentioned, policy changes that focus on lower energy costs for smelters, and uh, no restrictions on can sheet or its inputs. Madam Chair, thank you for the opportunity again to testify today, and I look forward to your questions if you have any. I've got a question. Sure. What is going to be the consequence to the beer industry because of what is going on in terms of the what you told us, 347 million and yep. the loss of jobs, what is going to be, ultimately, do you believe is going to be the consequence? The brewers are going to have to absorb that cost, unfortunately. The way that the pricing works within the beer industry, it's not something that we just pass on to the consumer. Um, that 347 million is going to be uh, absorbed by the brewing industry and it's going to impact our ability to reinvest in our businesses and our breweries. That's the bottom line. Okay. Any other questions? Chairman Parker? Yeah. Obviously, all of us are concerned about that number. Sure. Can you equate that to a unit cost? Per, uh, you know, I mean, effectively on a, on a unit of can. A per can, can cost? Uh, it, I, I can't. I can get you that number. Well, to that uh, date, I think it would be beneficial to everyone to understand. Sure. I know that. Just what's uh, going to have to be absorbed. Yeah. Secretary Ross has mentioned that it's going to be fractions of a cent per can. I believe when the tariffs were announced, he held up a, you know, a Campbell's soup can and, and said, you know, it's going to be, you know, tenth of a one percent or whatever uh, that was clearly wrong uh, you know there's there are two components to aluminum pricing there's the base price and then there's what's called the Midwest premium which used to be just kind of a shipping and handling price uh, but now the Midwest premium is a component that includes tariffs and a lot of other external factors and again that price has more than doubled since the um, since the tariffs were announced so it's gone from seven cents per pound to I believe 19 cents on Wednesday so more than a couple of cents per can. So the extent you give us that, that unit data, sure. that would be very, very helpful, I think, for members of the committee to be yeah, conversing absolutely. on those topics. Thank mm -hmm. you. Any other questions? Sure. Senator? Yeah. I'm a beer drinker. Good. <laughs> um, I'll happy to, I'm happy to have one with you at the end of the hearing. Shouldn't, shouldn't the industry <laughs> consider passing on the cost to the consumers so that we get irate and <laughs> provide well, more? So uh, force against uh, the imposition of these tariffs? Sure. So the uh, we have actually gotten that question before. The, um, the way that beverage alcohol is priced, and not just beer, but wine and distilled spirits, is unique among consumer products. As, as you guys know, I'm sure everybody here knows their beer wholesaler and distributor that is in their district. Um, when the beer is brewed and it leaves the brewery, it has to go to a wholesaler or distributor, which mm -hmm. then has to sell it to a retailer, which then has to sell it to a consumer. Uh -huh. So generally, beer is not a direct-to-consumer mm. uh, uh, kind of uh, consumer product, and, and only a few circumstances it, is it, uh, which means 
that you know the if we were to pass down the price to the distributor that means the distributor would then have to mark up that price which mm. would then have to mark up that price which mm. essentially makes beer less competitive in the marketplace than it does wine and distilled spirits for example which uh, mm. most of their products are uh, packaged in glass yeah well the the impact on the industry is uh, yes. is uh, huge is, is huge uh, yeah. as the chairwoman said i, I you know, I was wondering why the Beer Institute was here. Yeah. <laughs> and and uh, obviously the aluminum cost uh, then uh, uh, has a bearing on on your industry. So sure. It's, I mean, it's you can't for, for people to know that. Yeah. I mean, you can't. Uh, the the trend is that more packaging or more beer is going to be packaged in aluminum than than glass. Um, right now, we're at about sixty percent of beer comes in the form of an aluminum can or bottle. If you've been to a baseball game, it's not coming in glass. If you've been on a boat, you've gone to a pool, not coming in glass. Um, so the it's very difficult for us. We have two packaging methods: uh, aluminum and and glass, and yeah. we can't just flip that switch and. Uh, right. move everything to glass so well uh, you ought to point out that at least aluminum is recyclable it is do, it's infinitely so. recyclable so and you've actually right. noticed uh, a part of china's yeah. uh uh, retaliatory tariffs uh I, I believe somebody from the farm bureau just mentioned the ag products one of the uh products that China's retaliating against is U.S. scrap metal. And actually, the scrap uh, scrap metal industry uh, depends heavily on China as a, as a trading partner. Thank you. Yeah. Anything Thank else? you. Yes. Sure. Is this, is this three-tier uh, model that we mm -hmm. have in Texas, is that in every yes. state? Yes. Yes, okay. absolutely. So, so that is a market model, and I'm not here to argue against it. I mean, mm -hmm. we, we've got it. Yeah, we are completely in favor of the three-tier system. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, we've that. got it. Everybody, uh, I'm told everybody likes it. Uh, mm -hmm. No one stops me. I'm, I'm talking about no one in Walmart. Anyone stops me and says it's bad. Right. But that is a market, that is a, a, a regulatory decision that we've made in every 50 states. So when you say, you know, this rolls over to this and that rolls over. Yep. We have made that decision. Yep. Okay. Yeah, that, that, these are laws that uh, come out of prohibition. Quite yeah, I, I get it. And, and look, I'm not arguing against <laughs> it. Everybody likes it. <laughs> yeah. No beer drinker. Yeah. Uh, when I go to parties, no beer drinker pulls me aside and says, what's up with this three-tier model? <laughs> right. But, but the, Very but, few people know about it. Yeah, right. right. Yeah. But, <laughs> but the dilemma that we're talking about, yeah. okay, is a regulatory decision that we've made in, in legislature, the legislature throughout this country. Sure, yeah. It's not one that the market, well, you probably asked for it after prohibition, okay. <laughs> but it, it's, 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 it's a regulatory situation. Sure. Yeah. Okay, got it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you so much Thank for you, being Chair. here. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah. Our uh, last witness is David Gilliland, and of course, uh, even though you're last, you're just as important as the rest. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is David Gilliland. I'm a lawyer with law firm Duggins, Wren, Mann, and Romero in Austin, Texas, and I'm here on behalf of the Texas Pipeline Association. Terry Cannon, its president, expresses his regrets for not being able to be with you today. It probably, I, I think there's a presentation, and okay, so I go this way, or... So it's probably no surprise to you after testimony, it's already, um, you've heard that the oil and gas industry, and I've been asked, by the way, specifically to talk about the industry's position, and in particular the pipeline's position on the uh, uh, tariffs that have been proposed. Um, and it's probably no surprise that we're opposed to those tariffs. And what you may know, not understand are all the reasons why. Um, the eight national organizations that represent basically all the sectors of the oil and gas industry um, filed a letter with the House Committee on Ways and Means in March expressing their strong opposition to the tariffs and requesting product exclusions. Uh, the reason for, or one of the reasons for the pipeline industry having taken this position is attributable to the market itself. Um, pipeline quality steel is a niche market and it only represents about 3% of the total U.S. market for steel. The products are 
are time consuming to make. They're very expensive to make. And many manufacturers got out of this business a long time ago. So the industry as a result of that is uh, very dependent on imports to continue pipeline construction, which is occurring at, you know, maybe not record levels, but extremely aggressive levels, especially in Texas. Um, <clears throat> this can be just some facts and figures for you because I was asked to provide them, but 77% of the steel used in line pipe is imported. 53% of that is finished line pipe, 19% of it is cut to length plate and plate coil used to make line pipe in the U.S., and 5% is from steel slabs that's then further manufactured. 40% of the parts used to make high pressure valves are imported. 42% of the market value for finished steel pipeline fittings are imported. And disruptions from tariffs or changes under NAFTA, which has been discussed uh, at Greater Link today would delay or, in fact, stall pipeline and con or eliminate pipeline construction projects that are currently planned under certain scenarios. It's interesting to me, and I'm not really sure that I know why this is, um, but only three, only two percent of pipeline that's imported into the U.S. comes from China. Um, obviously, the largest producers or the largest uh, importers are from, imports are from China, I'm, I'm sorry, from Mexico and from Canada. Uh, but nonetheless, you know, the steel uh, tariff issue has been largely characterized as a, as a way of, of, of conducting business or addressing what are perceived as um, unfair trade practices by China. 75% of pipeline project spending goes to American workers. And this, this cuts at what, why, why this is an important issue for not only the oil and gas industry, but for American, and in particular for Texas, which I'll get to in a moment. Pipeline construction, and, and of course, these, the effects, the impacts of this are not known yet. Um, so these are projections that have largely been um, produced by a consulting firm called IFT. Um, but pipeline construction accounts for 45% of all project spending in the oil and gas industry. So American workers and construction contractors receive over a billion dollars in payroll and revenue on a typical pipeline project. And what was considered a <laughs> typical pipeline project was a 280-mile pipeline project of 36 inches in di diameter. And 25%, a 25 increase in cost, which is effectively a tax, translates into a $76 million cost increase for a typical pipeline project. So as you can see, there are gonna be instances where projects will either be delayed or not done. Uh, part of that delay may just be for the lack of availability of product. Part of it might be because of costs. So the industry uh, has not only uh, come out in opposition to the tariffs, but it opposed the Buy American Executive Order that was issued early in the Trump administration. It also is opposed to the repeal of NAFTA, and I don't need to go into the ways in which the oil and gas industry has benefited from NAFTA because that's been discussed uh, earlier. And so, you know, we feel that policy changes in this area have to weigh the potential harm to the growing energy independence of not only Texas, but the nation as a whole. Just in terms of, of Texas and what the oil and gas, gas industry provides, which you probably already know, it provides the equivalent of $30 million a day for Texas schools, universities, roads, and first responders. And in during fiscal year 2017, school districts received approximately $1.1 billion in property taxes from mineral uh, producing properties in oil and gas, natural gas pipelines, and gas, pi uh, gas utilities. Um, counties received $336 million. And Texas produced 40% of the nation's crude oil uh, when the U.S. crossed the $10 million barrels a day threshold. So these types of changes will not only impact the nation, but they will specifically impact Texas, as Texas is a leader in the move towards uh, independence from 
from imports of oil and gas. I'm happy to answer any questions. Representative Gonzalez. Um, thank you for being her last one. I sure. really appreciate your patience. I, I do have a couple of questions. Since NAFTA, the opening of the markets in Mexico, I think have really had a play in Texas, correct? The energy yes, markets? that's my understanding. I think one of my concerns is, particularly for my district, is now that the markets are open, but Mexico doesn't have eminent domain, what we have seen, particularly in my district, is a building of pipelines, multiple pipelines, coming into my district and using one, one, one location to go across the to go across the border. So we'll have seven pipelines going across seven farms or one farm, right? And so I think my concern and my qu my concern and then my question, <coughs> my concern is is that with the opening of Mexican markets, there has been a negative impact on local farmers and ranchers in Texas. And my question is is, is what does the pipeline industry want to advocate for to find a balance in protecting Texas agriculture? Um, the recent developments of Mexican markets and continuing to grow your industry? Well, I'm <laughs> <laughs> Lots of That's a question. <laughs> I'm not sure that this lowly tax lawyer from Austin, Texas can answer that question. Um, <clears throat> M domain is a huge concern, obviously, uh, in, in Texas and has been a, a kind of a hot button issue for a long time. Um, I think the, the, the reality of it is that as long as there's a need, and that need isn't necessarily dictated by the oil and gas industry, but as long as there's a need for these products, there is, unfortunately, the reality of how those products have to be taken to market. I, I completely understand that there, there is a need, and I want Mexico to benefit from our wonderful oil and gas industry here in Texas. What I think there is is an imbalance because of Mexico not having eminent domain and Texas having eminent, eminent domain, and that, ne and that imbalance negatively affecting Texas farmers and ranchers. I understand your concern. So I guess my only ask is if you could, if you could share my sentiment to, yes. the, to your folks um, in your a association. Absolutely. Thank you very much. You bet. And, I said, I, and I said it with a smile. <laughs> yes, you did. Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? No other questions? Then I am going to thank you so much thank for you. being here. I'm going to turn the gavel over to our chairman for the... Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, let's give uh, Representative Ortega a round of applause on running a heck of a meeting. Hi. Thank you also to Mexican-American Legislative Caucus Vice Chairperson um, Gonzalez for being here the whole time and for, from the lower chamber, Senator <laughs> Rodriguez, uh, for uh, accompanying us for the duration of the meeting. Thank you also to our generous hosts here in El Paso and to the participants who brought us the testimony. Uh, without further delay, uh, the Committee on International Trade and Intergovernmental Affairs stands adjourned, subject to call of the chair. <laughs>